forum already. And the Habitat Forum was really quite an interesting event because it was probably where most of the uh, real new ideas came from and then inspired also the decision makers. Next one. Barbara Ward, uh, with her two uh, books and a famous speech at that time, Only One Earth, the Home of Man, really drew attention to, uh, you know, we're a small world and we only have one and we better take care of it. Next one. So, and that of course is a personal interpretation, is uh, what was Habitat One in terms of uh, outcome? Well, the commitments were very clear uh, <clears throat> and they already existed to a certain degree. Uh, and it said uh, sustainable development uh, is development that means, it said that in the 87 report, but Barbara Ward had really already mentioned several of these ideas. Urbanization has to be tackled. Exploding cities was a famous um, video, film, that at that time was shown, where the alarm was sounded and say we better solve the uh, rapid urbanization. And commitments were made, and they were made quite innovatively. We really have to, let me just give you one example. It was said, for example, that land is a common good, not a private good, and that any development of land should be to the benefit of population at large. Can you imagine at that time, that formulation, um, that has been forgotten since then, but anyway, I think I repeat that because it was a very clear, one of the clear points. What actually happened is that right during and even before and after, other elements started to break down some of the commitments. Reaganism, Thatcherism, neoliberalism. Uh, that's, of course, my critical reflection uh, on that, and we can have discussions. Next one. As an intermediate element, I wanted to show this because there were already quite some early initiatives taken, training mid-career professionals, and you see some of the people around the table who were instrumental also in this uh, training program. Uh, and in fact, if you look very carefully, you can see one of the Turkish participants uh, in the picture, uh, a lady who is uh, sitting here um, and who is professor uh, at the university here, but she was a student at that time at uh, our university. Uh, and of course, uh, visiting people like John Turner, um, like Elijah Gavey, and uh, some of the younger people. One of the trainees in the program, you can see him here, he is now one of the top people in UN Habitat, and some of you from Maruf must have uh, met him in the last May meeting in Istanbul, I think. Uh, Mr. Raftitz. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. As an outcome of the um, uh, sorry, now we're coming to Habitat 2. Uh, you could in one catchphrase say it was the emerging human settlements governance. You know, 76 was sounding the alarm, but 96 was already saying, well, we have made commitments, but let's now get to business and organize and govern and uh, manage things uh, much better. So, of course, in between we had other important ones that the Rio 92, uh, the Cairo uh, population, women conference, the Kyoto Protocol, all of that, and things that came out, the Habitat Agenda uh, 21, which I think uh, was an important uh, document. So in that sense, I think 96 was quite important, particularly for this Habitat Agenda, which described really in detail and followed the um, 
Agenda 21 of, uh, of Rio. Uh, a lot of that was very detailed, very well developed. Uh, <clears throat> but again, if you look at uh, the results, and I think this is again the critical note, the result is that although Habitat, the Agenda 21, Habitat Agenda were right, uh, they emphasized, for example, the right to housing, um, the uh, <clears throat> enabling strategies, sustainable development, uh, the recognition of the value of informal, formal settlements, and the complementarity was emphasized. But not all governments really, they committed or they said they committed themselves to the right to housing, but in reality, uh, it didn't really happen. And for example, slum clearance evictions still continue. Public-private partnerships was advocated, but it really turned out very often to be public duties and private uh, profit. Local authorities was very clearly mentioned and importantly um, established, and they were really taken seriously as partners in the uh, dialogue, the uh, enabling strategies, but that was again discussed. And the question was raised whether the public sector was not leaving the burden too much to the citizen by sort of relinquishing and saying, no, no, let the citizens do things. <clears throat> I uh, cannot enumerate all of the different programs that in, you know, b before 96 and after 96 really developed uh, many, many very interesting ones. Uh, a few ones are listed here, but there are quite a, a lot more. But what is important is that the World Urban Fora, which in fact had been, continue, had been starting in, in Vancouver, because there was already a Habitat Forum, but now were formally established as World Urban Fora. And um, the tenth one is in preparation, February uh, 2020 in Abu Dhabi. Um, and um, the last one, of course, was in Malaysia, uh, and so they were, we don't have time to really go into it, but in my opinion, the, the World Habitat Fora were equally important in terms of larger debate, in terms of community organizations, in terms of local authorities meeting between each other. You know, the, this was not at all just uh, people from uh, official government delegations. They were also there, but it was much, much broader and in that sense much more important. Of course, it, uh, by then we had the uh, Millennium Development Goals. I won't say much about it, I just want to say that uh, it was established that also each country should check how far are they in the Millennium Development Goals. This is just an example of India, you could see the red and the green dots, and meaning the reds, we haven't done much, and the green is, okay, we're on the way. Let me take just one example, is uh, in the uh, Millennium Development Goals, there was a specific item about improving the lives of 100 million slum dwellers. Well, that's very nice and very important. And it was achieved, but look, at what happened. While it was achieved, at the same time, the number of slum dwellers grew so that 100 million solved meant that it really was only a small part. And in fact, uh, there was a, a growing number of slum dwellers. While you were solving the problem, we're not solving it fast enough. And I think that is a very important uh, conclusion. Of course, I don't have to repeat that. Everyone knows that. But that, I think, the reason why I show it is very simply because there was a big debate in Quito and after Quito is why do we need a new urban agenda? Because we have the sustainable development goals already. Very important, the difference between the early scheme of sustainability was that sustainability was a very small part between people, planet, and profit. 
and you see the word profit has been replaced by prosperity, which is quite an added peace partnership. Planet people, of course, still there. And sustainable development has a much stronger uh, element. And so, 2016, Quito was towards establishing a new uh, urban agenda. You could call it renewing the commitments. Um, <clears throat> one element that is very important is given that cities are now operating on a radically different economic and social ecosystem than in the 20th century. So that was the need for that uh, event. Um, preparation was quite exhaustive, as it was for the previous conferences. I show here just uh, many different steps, group of experts meeting, etc., etc., uh, different regional meetings, different drafts, zero drafts. Um, but what was very clear is that urbanization was uh, now recognized something as internal indigenous and that new models to effectively address challenge of climate change had to be developed. Urbanization as a tool for social integration and uh, equity. And then a few final slides just to say the debate. The debate is, but wait a minute, we have the SDGs already and SDG 11 says make cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. So what are we doing? Are we repeating the work that has already been done? Or, because look at what was already there. Um, yet, the urban agenda uh, <clears throat> was developed, and uh, it, the least word could say, it also aimed at addressing the unfinished businesses of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, <clears throat> Commitments uh, were there, uh, stronger local authorities, the right to housing was expanded to the right to the city, increasing the care for public places, respecting heritage, etc., strengthening resilience, more equity. But the reality is that uh, many thought that, uh, well, wait a minute, we have critical reflections. What are the commitments? of the different partners, for example, the private sector, increasing neoliberalism uh, and then emerging populism and individualism. And there came again the debate between United Nations versus local authorities. Some people went as far as saying, we don't need United Nations, we need United Cities or United Human Settlements. That, of course, is something that touches upon uh, a very fundamental element. So, uh, I'm just finishing here um, and saying, if you look at the bottom here, towards Habitat 4, 2036. The question is, if you look at the two uh, photographs, the one uh, on the left side seems to be the old image of a thriving city. And I won't name any city because I want to be diplomatic for once, but uh, these are not the cities, I think, of the future. These are not the cities that in 2036 we want to have. At least we want to have cities that not only from top down, but people from bottom up can say, we, we want to have a city that is our city, that we feel as our city and is not just imposed on us as an infrastructure on top of it. Okay, um, thank you very much, but it's up to the next generation. 2036 will be the next generation to develop that, learning from the old previous generation. Thank you. Thank you, Sayyim Verşura. Yalnızca üç habitat zirvesiyle sınırlı kalmayıp diğer uluslararası zirvelerin de bu sürece nasıl etki yaptığını ve e, habitat daha doğrusu kentsel gündemi de sorgulayıcı e, sunumu kapsamında şükranlarımı sunuyoruz. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Hiç vakit kaybetmeden hemen ikinci konuşmacımıza geçiyoruz. Çünkü zamanımız giderek daralıyor. Sayın 
e, Geoffrey Payne. E, aynı şekilde 50 yıllık deneyim dünyanın her yerinde e, çalışmalar yürütmüş. Bunların içerisinde Hindistan, Mısır, Papua, Yeni Gine gibi yerler var. Hatta e, o kapsamda eşiyle de tanışmış ve e, böyle bir evlilik vesilesi de olmuş. E, yine bir sürü uluslararası kuruluşun e, UNDP, e, UN Habitat gibi kuruluşların danışmanlığını yapmış, yapmaya devam ediyor. Aynı zamanda e, bu kadar işin içerisinde e, bir glider, e, planör pilotu olarak da 30 küsur yıldır bunun eğitimini veriyor. E, Tanya kızı da e, babasının izinden dünyayı dolaşarak e, fotoğrafçılık ve haber yaparak da benzer bir e, kariyeri benimsemiş durumda. Hiç sözü uzatmayayım. E, bu kendi birikimini, kendi deneyimini sözü Sayın Peyn'e bırakalım. Biz de paylaşsınlar. Bu flor izliyorsa. It's uh, great to be back in Turkey again and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this session uh, and to meet uh, some very great friends that I've known for more years than I care to uh, acknowledge. Um, I uh, would like to compliment Hans' presentation who gave a very comprehensive summary of the issues that were presented and discussed uh, by giving perhaps, if you'll excuse me, a personal perspective on these issues. Uh, so if I could have the first slide. Oh, thank you. Um, the situation um, in 1976 was, in some respects, very different. In other respects, very similar to today. Um, I was not at uh, Vancouver, um, but I had just finished a research report on urban housing and planning in Ankara. Uh, having come here, first of all, in 1974, I finished the report uh, about 1977, but as Habitat I was taking place, I was actually working with John Turner uh, in London, uh, teaching on the courses of urban planning and housing. And of course, it was a great privilege to see one of the great figures of housing globally, um, some of the giants of, uh, on whose shoulders most of my generation has, uh, has been building, um, to see the principles that he was espousing, I was once asked what I thought was the greatest idea that I've ever seen, or the, le the last great idea. And I think it comes down to what John Turner and his uh, colleagues, William Mangan and others that uh, Hannah's referred to, was saying, uh, was that this was the way of looking at the world in a different way. My generation was trained that architects and planners had the information, the knowledge, and the experience to plan and manage cities and to provide people with adequate housing. We then realized, of course, that a large proportion of the world cannot conform to the standards and norms that professionals and governments expect of them. The result is large proportions of unplanned, unauthorized, in fact, it was planned, but according to very different criteria, to the ones the planners and professionals were looking at. And what John did, which was a great service to the professions and to the understanding of these issues, was to show that the informal, um, the self-generated housing uh, was in fact part of the solution, not the problem. In other words, he looked at the world through the other end of the telescope, and I think that was very important in Habitat One. The other thing which I was very impressed by was that his view of looking at housing was that housing is a process and it, what, it's what it does for people, not just what it is. And it's therefore vital that people have a say in the design, location and use of their housing. And Habitat One, he made the greatest uh, contribution with his book, Housing by People, uh, which I think was, uh, was a good way of putting it. And, I was impressed to see, looking through my notes of the Habitat One process, of course we all pick on the things that we find of particular interest, uh, but for me the interest on inequitable growth will lead to unacceptable living conditions. It also established the right of housing as a human right, which we're still trying to recognize and to implement. And section D of the report noted that private ownership contributes to social injustice. 
Now, of course, individual ownership has been promoted globally uh, by national governments, by international agencies, as the solution to the problem. And yet, 40 years ago, it was already recognized if it got too far to lead to injustice. So uh, those are my reflections on Habitat One. Um, and I think that was a major event because it focused international attention on both the scale of the challenge and the nature of the challenge. And it enabled all the building professions and planning professions, architects, engineers, surveyors, uh, quantity surveyors, in, and, and so on, um, to see the issue in a more holistic way. At the time of Habitat One, as I said, I was working on a project in Egypt. And in most consultancy projects at that time, it was normal for consultants to have their own office. And then you would have a meeting room at the end of the corridor to discuss the overall issues. When we did our project, there was not enough space to operate in that way. We all had our desks around the side of the room. And in the middle was a table, a big table, where we would sit for meetings. But on that table was a map of the city we were trying to plan. That meant psychologically, we were continually aware that we were contributing to something bigger than ourselves something that was more important than our own individual expertise. And I think that holistic approach is something which I've always regarded as one of the elements of the success of that project and something that I've always recommended and tried to achieve ever since. So a holistic multidisciplinary approach, uh, rather than the silos in which the professions often work, I think was central. But moving on to Habitat 2, um, before Habitat 2, uh, I, my research on all of these issues uh, led me to publish a book, uh, to, to jointly edit a book, which was called The Living City Towards a Sustainable Future. John Turner, Arif Hassan, and Herbert Girardet all contributed very important chapters to that book. I was rather flattered two months ago to receive a notice from the publishers saying they planned to reissue it. Now, obviously, it's nice to have a book reissued 29 years after you've published it. But the subtitle of the book was Towards a Sustainable Future. And that rather depressed me, because if you think that the book is still needed 29 years later, then obviously the lessons were not learned in the first place. So I think it's a rather sobering as well as a flattering experience. Uh, that this book is con still considered necessary or appropriate. For me, the most important uh, element of Habitat 2, which I was able to attend in Istanbul and which was another major global experience, was that while there was not much on finance or land management, uh, not as much as I was hoping, having made that my area of specialization, uh, what was very important, I, I still remember many sessions in which Herbert Girardet, who had contributed to this book on the living city, was being always surrounded by journalists because he was talking about the ecology footprint of urban areas, how urban areas expanding into agricultural areas, the tensions that that creates culturally and economically and environmentally and how we do need to put land to efficient use socially, culturally, and economically, try and create compact cities um, and in order to uh, uh, sustain, protect the environment. Moving on to habitat, sorry, uh, the, the, there were many people um, uh, present, as I said, uh, the book that I contributed to um, has now been reissued. So moving on to habitat three in, in Quito, um, I was invited by UN Habitat, and, and I suppose this is where my work in the previous uh, 20 years had um, enabled me to, uh, to become better known in terms of looking at land issues. I'd published widely on land tenure issues. I was very angry with the way that the World Bank had been promoting individual ownership, um, and I questioned a lot of the assumptions and the claims that the bank was making and which others have been making, uh, promoting individual ownership 
as the solution to global problems and saying that if the de de uh, developing world followed the West, uh, then individual ownership was the means of accessing credit, uh, that credit would enable you to open a business and everyone could escape poverty and become middle class income uh, groups. Um, the research I did on that demonstrated that this is a false claim. There is no empirical evidence that I have seen since to support that, although I remain um, open to any evidence to the contrary. Um, of course, I'm not saying that individual ownership is wrong. I own my own house. It would be hypocritical of me to say that people should not own that. But experience has taught me that that should not be for the... Uh, for everybody, it is only, it's certainly not suitable for the young, the old, or the poor. Um, so Habitat 3, really, um, I was able to, I was invited to contribute, to moderate a special session on housing um, in which I was asked to give some of these comments and to introduce some of the uh, key speakers on that. Um, uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute. I was also invited by Han Verschur's organization at uh, the Catholic University of Leuven to contribute to a session, uh, give a keynote paper on a parallel session on community development, land tenure, and social innovation. Um, and that enabled me to present some of the work that we've been doing on land tenure and property rights. Um, I'm very pleased to say that that will be a con contribution to a book which... Uh, uh, Catholic University Leuven and also the uh, Network Association of European Researchers on Urbanization in the South um, uh, will be published later this year. And then third, um, I was a member of a panel, it was very interesting, talking to a wide range of contributors, mayors, consultants, NGOs and academics from different countries uh, we were all asked to speak for a few minutes and that for me was another major opportunity because one of the concerns I have about all these sort of conferences and the World Urban Fora is that it can be a tendency for us to preach to the converted. I'm sure all of us here today are concerned about the issues of urbanization, of urban opportunities, um, inequality and the environmental challenge. Uh, but I do think that one of the big opportunities, certainly in Habitat 3, was participating with people from very different backgrounds and different perspectives. Because the key issue for me is that we do not just talk among ourselves, but we reach out to the wider public and engage with the political debates of our, in, in our own countries. Um, so those are the three things. And in, in, in addition, my wife, who's left the, to go home this morning, but she was invited by UN Habitat to... Um, moderate another special session on housing at the center of sustainable development. Um, and I attended an event uh, organized by Catherine Golda Pongratz, um, who had made a film going back to the archive material that John Turner had done the previous 20 years for Habitat One. Uh, and she's made a film on Turner's work by going back to Peru, talking to some of the original households who have been involved in the settlements and also talking to their children and the next generation. So it was a longitudinal assessment of what's happened and what lessons can be learned. So that was a very good opportunity to go back and complete the circle. Um, now, of course, Habitat 3 had various objectives, identify key structural and global issues, uh, the challenges to housing, exchange perspective on placing housing at the center of the agenda, proposing ways forward to guarantee the right to adequate housing uh, in the implementation of the new urban agenda. Um, that was structured in four parts, outlining the challenges, panel discussions, and so on. I think on reflection, one of the um, disappointments of Habitat 3 is that it did not come up with operational conditions and requirements whereby governments agreed to implement the recommendations which have been made in the new urban agenda. There is a concern I have that it's saying all the right things, but not in a way which is binding upon anybody. Um, now, of course, one has to accept that if all the countries in the world are negotiating, you are inevitably going to achieve a compromise. That is, I think, an understandable limitation 
of any international UN Habitat conference. Um, at the same time, I think there is a danger that if we accept this as the basis for action, we can guarantee that only those countries that are really committed to achieving the SDGs and the MDGs and all the other objectives of the new urban agenda, they will be the only ones that make a difference. Everyone else will carry on as normal. I've just come back from Bhutan. Two days ago, I was in Bhutan. For me, what was the amazing experience was that Bhutan in the 1970s changed its definition of development. I was watching the news this morning and they were talking about a crisis in China and America with trade disputes, how that will affect global economic growth. Everyone talks about GDP as the definition of progress. For me, I've just read a book called GDP, Gross Domestic Problem. And that is a very interesting book I recommend. Bhutan and Vanuatu, Vanuatu is one of the most vulnerable environmental countries in the world, one of the poorest. But Vanuatu and uh, Bhutan have defined their definition of development and progress as gross national happiness. New Zealand has changed recently to measuring progress by gross national well-being. For me, this is an exciting opportunity to question for the first time in human history what we mean by progress. Do we need more and more money, more and more stuff, or should we redefine what we mean by a good quality of life? And that, for me, is what the UN agendas and the, all the discussions that we have collectively should be about. One of the most uh, uh, impassionate uh, or passionate uh, contributions at the um, uh, session I moderated was by Leilana, Leilana Fari, who was the Special Rapporteur on Housing. And she talked about the need for a passionate uh, recognition of the right to housing. Um, now, of course, it's all very well to have a right, but if you can't achieve or implement that, it means nothing. It was interesting also the, the minister from France, of course, giving her government's perspective. And I think as a consultant, as an independent uh, consultant, I'm very conscious that I'm very privileged to see the issues, but I do not have the responsibility of making the compromises necessary to achieve implementation on the ground. So it's very easy for people like me to make uh, grand statements and observations. I fully accept that for people under pressure with ministers demanding attention, how they move forward. But I do think that uh, all of these issues need to be considered in their broadest context. One of the things which I notice has not been addressed at Habitat 3 which has become the issue in the three years since is the climate crisis. So it shows in a way that the things that were addressed in Habitat 1, 2, and 3 about inequality, the need for social justice, the need for human rights and housing still remains on the top of the agenda to which we now have to add the environmental crisis of climate, crisis, climate heating, not climate warming, climate heating. Um, and I was very, you know, I think we're all aware that we've now got 16-year-old girls telling world leaders what needs to happen. My generation, our generation around the table here, I think is possibly the luckiest generation in the whole of human history. We are in danger of passing the world on to the younger generation, many of you here in this room, in a very bad state, in a way which you will have to address the indulgent way of life that we have lived and are living. Please accept my apologies from my generation for the world we're passing on to you. We, the four of us, I know, are doing what we can in the years and time that we have left uh, to, to remedy and address the, uh, the, the challenges. And I hope very much that we'll be able to pass the world on to you uh, in a better state than it is at the moment. But thank you very much for this opportunity. Sayın Peyne bu kapsamlı ama bir boyutuyla da insanın yüreğine dokunan konuşması için çok teşekkür ediyoruz.
Şimdi hemen bir başka önemli ismi Habitat deyince dünyada insanın ilk akla gelen isimlerinden birine Sayın Nicolas Yue'ye geçiyoruz. Kendisi e, uzun yıllar UN Habitat'ın e, politika danışmanı olarak e, görev yaptı ki İstanbul'da düzenlenen Habitat iki konferansı sırasında da kendisi İstanbul'da bunun yöneticisi olarak görev yapıyordu. E, yine gerek Habitat'la gerek sürdürülebilirlikle ilgili çeşitli uluslararası ağlarda, yapılarda gerek yöneticilik, gerek kuruculuk, gerek devam eden eş başkanlık rolleri devam ediyor. Sayın e, Yun'un şimdilerde e, Guangzhou'daki Kentsel İnovasyon Enstitüsü'nün e, yönetici direktörü. Kuşkusuz boş durmuyor bu arada. Çok çeşitli yerel yönetimlere, merkezi yönetimlere, iş dünyasına, sivil toplum kuruluşlarına sürdürülebilirlik konusunda, e, özellikle kentsel inovasyon konusunda, yönetişim konusunda e, danışmanlıklarını, desteklerini sürdürüyor. Sanıyorum dünyadaki bütün büyük şehirlerle de benzer bir ilişkisi vardır. Sözü daha fazla uzatmadan Sayın Nikolas Yüya bırakayım. Buyurun. Thank you very much and greetings to everybody. Um, I just, um, I'm reminded that uh, the four of us sitting at this table represent 300 years of professional experience, which is uh, <laughs> quite frightening when you think about it. But um, nonetheless, we are, as you can see, still struggling on trying to find um, better solutions and better ways forward. I will not uh, go back to Habitat 1, 2, and 3 as my predecessors did because I realized that being the third person to speak that most of the issues would have been covered by uh, Hans and by Joffrey. I just want to say that at having been involved in all three conferences, in Habitat 1 I was part of the NGO forum, Habitat 2 I was part of the team that organized Habitat 2, In Habitat 3, I was heading uh, the um, collective voice of the civil society organizations, otherwise known as the uh, United, uh, the Global Urban uh, Partners campaign. What I think was important is that at each one of these conferences, we planted seeds that influenced thinking for the ensuing 20 years. So I think Habitat 1, as was mentioned already previously, planted the seed for housing as a basic need and a right. Unfortunately, that battle still has to be won. Habitat 2, I think we planted the seed for the right to the city. And that was a very much debated issue at uh, Quito in Habitat 3. But I think Habitat 3 did something else also, which my previous speakers did not mention, is that it planted the seeds for what I would call a systems approach to sustainable urbanization. And this is very important because until Habitat 3, basically we were still thinking sectorally, we were acting sectorally. We're looking at housing independent from water, from infrastructure, from energy, from transport, etc. And to a large extent, we are still doing that today. But the seed was planted that we need, if you wish, a phrase that was already used 40 years ago, a holistic, more holistic approach to begin to solve these problems. And one of the underlying themes that has occurred over and over again since Habitat 3 is innovation. And what I would like to do is in the next few minutes just go over a few concrete examples that in my work, my daily work, I have been able to come across on what I believe are truly innovative approaches to solving some of the old problems, the problems that we're still struggling with 40 years after Habitat 1. So without much further ado, I will go to some examples. Now, what do we mean by urban innovation? Urban innovation, in the context of all the discussions that we've had around Habitat 3 and since Habitat 3, is basically a call for new ways of thinking. And that these new ways of thinking be translated into new policies, 
new technologies, new business models, about integrating culture and heritage into our way of thinking about sustainability, also about new forms of partnerships, new forms of engagement, and new forms of governance. One of my favorite examples that I've come across in my work recently is the city of Surabaya in Indonesia. And what fascinated me about the example of Surabaya in terms of new policies is that the city of Surabaya did not have a budget for environmental management. It had a budget for waste collection, it had a budget for street cleaning, but it did not have a specific budget for environmental management. And yet the mayor decided that what was happening to her city was no longer acceptable. Of course, Surabaya is growing. Its GDP is growing quite rapidly, uh, as the GDP of Indonesia is growing quite rapidly. Its population is growing as well quite rapidly, average about 4% per year. But the solid waste was growing at above 10% a year. So in a very brief period of three years, this mayor was able to reduce not only the per capita production of uh, waste, but also the absolute amount of waste. For me, the first city in the world that has done this on a systematic basis. And she did this without a budget. She did this by launching a movement. And this movement started with the low-income neighborhoods, where everybody started collecting their waste, separating their waste, started forming micro-enterprises to process that waste into a resource. So basically what she was doing was implementing a circular economy. And what, she, what we discovered by looking at what she had done was that she was tackling at the same time five of the sustainable development goals. Sustainable cities, of course, good health and well-being, because reducing the absolute amount of liquid and solid waste, of course, has a major impact on health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, because much of the organic waste was being transformed into biogas, and decent work and economic growth. Oh, thousands of jobs were created through this initiative. But the key, one of the key aspects of Surabaya, which I think epitomizes the spirit of Surabaya, is that today in Surabaya, if you take the bus and if you bring the equivalent of three one and a half liter plastic bottles, you don't pay for the bus. So basically, all the children, all the elderly people, all the people with limited income are collecting plastic bottles and they come and they get a free bus ride. But the real impact of this is not that you are just collecting and recycling plastic. It's that imagine how many specialized vehicles do you need to collect plastic from different plastic bins around the city every day. Here, all the plastic bottles of Surabaya are being collected by the public transport system and all the buses end up in the same depot. So you're solving two problems, a problem of plastic and you're solving a problem of how to collect and transport that plastic. I'm going to the other side of the world to a, a small municipality in Canada. Surabaya is a very big city, very six million people. Repigny is a small city with a few hundred, hundred thousand inhabitants. It's part of Greater Montreal. They had a big problem with youth and youth integration in their society. And they were learning from other best practices on how to integrate youth into social and economic life. And one of the things that they really, really came across, which I thought was really innovative, is that they decided that to convert all their public libraries, which in most cities today are underutilized, into places where you can learn how to program, places where you can play games, and you can develop new applications. 
So basically, instead of using, creating new incubators where young people can get together and learn the tools that they allow them to integrate new technology, here we use an old infrastructure, the library, and converted the library into a creative space where young people after school can go there, do their gaming, but also learn how to program and learn how to develop new applications. This has helped the city solve also the issue of quality education, because it's looking at continuing education after school hours. A very important aspect is the gender equality that it's been able to achieve. Decent work and economic growth. A lot of the children coming to, this, um, to these libraries after school are developing lifetime skills that will help them find work. And of course, SDG 11. Now I'm coming to Turkey. And this story is one of my favorite, even though I know it's a very hot topic right now in Turkey, the integration of immigrants, especially Syrian immigrants. You have a city here called Mezetli that, uh, unlike many other cities in Western Europe that had to accept a lot of Syrian refugees and immigrants of a more qualified nature, most of the immigrants, Syrian immigrants or refugees that landed in Mezetli were from rural areas with very few skills that they could use immediately in the job market. Approximately 60,000 registered refugees and immigrants, which means that the real figure is most probably much bigger. So after several, two years of knocking their heads together, the mayor decided to do something which I found is truly innovative. He did something which doesn't exist very much in this region. He created women-only markets. And what has happened is that the local women, Turkish women, together with the women immigrants, have created these markets together, in one in each neighborhood. And these markets are now providing not only jobs, but also linking one of the key issues that came up during Habitat 3 is how to ensure urban-rural linkages. All right, so there's, now there's a direct link between farmers and the markets. Of course, this is a major boost to gender equality. It's, um, they have also, they have in these markets, they collect all the organic waste to produce uh, biogas energy, which is making these markets not entirely, but partially self-sufficient in energy. Of course, decent work. And one of the biggest problems we're facing today, the whole issue of social integration of immigrants and refugees. This is my all-time favorite story that I've come across recently. And it has to deal with one of the key issues that I think worry almost every single mayor in an emerging economy today. And that is, what do we do with disenchanted youth? What do we do with children that drop out of school? What do we do with um, the disenfranchised? So this is the case of La Paz, Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia is part of the Andean group of countries which um, are still relatively poor and contrary to the rest of Latin America, still in the process of witnessing rural to urban migration. Most of Latin America is already highly urbanized, where the growth of cities is due to people migrating from smaller cities to bigger cities. But this is not the case of La Paz, where every year we have tens of thousands of farmers who are migrating directly to the city. And of course, this has for any, any of you who have perhaps been to La Paz, it, it created one of the worst situations globally in terms of traffic accidents. We had people, who, pedestrians that did not respect traffic rules, and we had drivers who did not respect traffic, traffic rules. As a result, there were very, the highest incidents in the world for uh, road-related injuries and accidents. Again, they tried everything, police, reinforcing the police, putting in traffic wardens, increasing the fines, civic education, 
nothing worked. So in the end, the mayor of this, of La Paz, decided to do something quite original, um, and he basically mobilized the gangs of La Paz, youth that had dropped out of school, youth that had formed gangs, who were on the verge of becoming part of organized crime, and he trained them in mime and clown techniques. So basically they learned how to become a clown or a mime. They are dressed up as zebras, as you can see, and what they do is that they make fun of the pedestrians and the drivers. They make you look very stupid, but in a very friendly way, in a non-threatening way. I went, I, I went to see this project a year and a half ago, and it has transformed pedestrian behavior, it has transformed driver behavior, but most importantly, when I interviewed some of the youth that were involved in this, some 7,000, almost 7,000 youth were involved in this initiative over a period of 10 years. More than 75% either went back to school or found jobs. And when I asked the social workers, the welfare workers, the educators, how do you explain such a big success rate on social integration of youth at risk? They told me that a young person, the main reason why a young person drops out of school, drops out of society, is lack of self-esteem. And this Zebra project gave these youth power, real power. Power to tell adults, power to tell the general population how stupid they were, but again, in a friendly way. The last one I would like to mention is, again going back to Indonesia, is a slum. And this is one of the few cases in my career, and I've worked now for 40 years on slum upgrading and all the various different strategies for slum improvement. And this one really struck me as being highly successful. What happened in this slum is that a quite an enlightened leader, local leader, uh, decided that we, given that they, it rains all the time in this part of Indonesia, that the best thing they could do was to capture this rain, harvest this rain, and produce fruits and vegetables. So just take a look at these pictures. This is Glintun before, all the streets flooded. This is Glintun three years later every single street has been converted into an urban farm. And those of you who have been to Indonesia will most probably agree with me that one of the things that is hard to find in Indonesia is fresh vegetables. It's not part of their traditional diet. But of course with growing awareness, there's tremendous demand, especially by the growing middle class, for fresh vegetables. And what they are using is aquaponics, to grow all forms of vegetables that are now being sold in the supermarkets and the boutique vegetable stalls throughout East Java. The income of the uh, people living in this slum has increased over 800%. In fact, they can no longer be considered poor. Right? They can be considered as a burgeoning middle class. That's the difference. And I think this is one of the key problems we always faced with slum improvement, slum upgrading, is that we wanted to tackle the physical aspect, the infrastructure aspect, the services aspect, the building construction aspect. The key, the key to solving the entire problem is the income aspect. Give these people a source of income and the slum will no longer exist in its present form. So what are some of the concluding observations? I think by looking at these case studies, and I've, the observations don't only come from these four case studies, they come from about 100 different case studies, is that 
what can really make a difference in sustainable urbanization is an age-old principle that we already mentioned way back in Habitat 1, and that is that we have to put people first. But one that got lost along the way, which I think is becoming more and more important, is that it's the public sector, it's government, at all levels, it's municipal government, it's provincial government, regional government that needs to exercise leadership. That leadership cannot come from the private sector and it cannot come from the community sector alone. We need strong leadership at the public sector level. We need to push for high standards of quality. I think one mistake that I have learned in 40 years of working with habitat-related issues is that we always compromised on quality in the end. We are constantly lowering standards, constantly lowering our own professional exigencies. Finally, we have to engage in continuous learning. We need to share information like we've never shared before. And we need to engage people. Participation is old hat. Participation is not enough. We have to engage people. Engaging people meaning giving them the real levers, the real means, the real tools to participate in decision making. Not just consulting them, but giving them real power. And then finally, we need to recognize leadership at all levels. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And Sayın Nicholas Yuya vermiş olduğu bu çok önemli mesajlar. Ve aynı zamanda ölçeğine bakılmaksızın iyi uygulamaların nasıl fark yaratabileceği konusundaki sunumu için gerçekten çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi son konuşmacımız. İlhan Tekeli hocamı sizlere tanıtmaya gerek yok. Kendisi de tanıtılmayı sevmiyor. Dolayısıyla hani 110'dan fazla kitabı olduğunu, şehir planlamadan bilim felsefesine kadar uzanan 660'dan fazla makalesi olduğunu söylemeyeceğim. Hızlıca geçeceğim. Ama şunu söylemeden geçemeyeceğim. Habitat iki sürecinde İlhan hocamız izninizle bu sürecin temel direği olmuştur demek zorundayım. Yüzlerce sivil toplum kuruluşuyla birebir çalışarak bütün bu e, sürecin katılımcı bir şekilde ilgili raporlara yansımasını sağlayarak e, yaşanabilirlik gibi yaşanabilirlik kavramının e, arka kapıdan dokümanlara girmesini sağlayarak gerçekten çok e, önemli katkılarda bulundu. Hatta o dönemde governance kelimesinin karşılığı bile yoktu. Yönetişim kelimesini de dilimize hocamı sokmuştur. Lafı fazla kızdırmadan uzatmayayım hemen kendisine bırakıyorum. Sa Sadun'a çok teşekkür ederim. Tabii Sadun benim uzun zamandır dostum. Ee, biraz bana torpil yapıyor <gülüyor> anlatırken. Ee, ben bu toplantıda konuşmak için bir bildiri hazırlamıştım, yazılmış. Onu takip etmeyeceğim. Habitat zirvelerinin yapabildiklerinin ve yapabileceklerinin sınırları üzerine diye bir başlığı vardı. Tabii bu başlığın içini doldurabilmek için birinci, ikinci, üçüncü habitatın tarihsel gelişimi ve o gelişim içinde nasıl bir politika değiştirdiği ve sonunda her üçünün de politikalarının niye uygulanmadığını anlatmaya çalışan bir bildiriydi. Ama dostlarım çok iyi sunuşlar yaptılar. Habitat'ın tarihi gelişmesini gayet iyi anlattılar. Onun için ben de onları tekrar etmemek için yeni bir formatta bir konuşma yapmaya çalışacağım. Onun için üç tane Sadun'un son konuşmasını da gözene alarak üçlü bir konuşma yapacağım. Birinci olarak habitat zirvesi yapmak ne demektir? Habitat zirvesinde ne tür ürün çıkar ve ne, neden o ürünler uygulanamaz. O soruyu alacağım. İkinci olarak ee, şöyle bir şey. Eğer bu ürünlerin niye uygulanmadığı üstünde durur, durursak 
bu uygulanmama sürecini yalnız habitat metinlerinin birbirinden farklılığı üstünden açıklayamayız. Aslında esas sormamız gereken ve sormadığımız soru niye ulus devletler artı Birleşmiş Milletler'den oluşan bir sistem bugün dünyayı yönetemiyor. Bu yönetemeyiş beşimi üstünü de bir sorgulama yapmadan habitat metinlerinin niye uygulanmadığını tartışamayız. Onun için ikinci olarak tartışacağım konu niye bugün dünya yönetilemiyor sorusu. Üçüncü olarak da son Sadun'un sözü üstüne ikinci habitat zirvesinde Türkiye neyi yapabildi ve oradaki bu sürecin özgün yanları nelerdi? Türkiye'nin buna ne kadar katkısı oldu olmadı ve Habitat'ın Türkiye'ye ne kadar katkısı oldu o süreci analiz etmeye çalışacağım. İstediğin zaman zaman kıt biliyorum. Onun için istediğin zaman kesebilirsin. Ben bu üç, üçünden birini atabilirim. Şimdi birinci soru Habitat zirvesi nedir? 1976 20 yılda bir yapılıyor bir kere. 20 yıl uzun erimli bir planlama periyodudur. Yani mevcut süreçleri uzun erimde kontrol etmek için 20 yıl aralıkla yapılıyor. Ve böyle bir perspektifi olunca yaptığı verdiği kararlar ya stratejik tercihler yahut da politika tercihleri üstünde oluyor. Action plan dediği zaman ki metinlerin isimleri o sanmayın ki pratikte uygulanacak bir şey. Bunlar daha çok polisi düzeyinde şeyler. Ee, bir, genellikle habitatların üçüne de baktığımız zaman bir yapıldığı şehrin ismiyle bir deklarasyon yayınlıyor. İstanbul Deklarasyonu, Vancouver Deklarasyonu, e, Kita Deklarasyonu. Bu deklarasyon aslında o dönemde yaş- yap- temel iki soruya cevap veriyor. Bir, yerleşmeler konusunda ne tür problemler oluyor? Konut konusunda ne tür problemler oluyor? Şimdi İkinci metin genellikle işte isline ajanda 21 günden bilmem ne denilen temelde bir aksiyon planı ve şeylerden oluşuyor. Politika düzeyindeki önerilerden oluşuyor. Ama biz habitat olayını yalnız entelektüel ürünleri üstünden kavramaya çalışırsak eksik kalırız. Aslında bu toplantılar 10-15 gün süren uzun süreleri kapsıyor. Bu bir çeşit son zamanlarda çok kullanılan bir terim var. Mega event dedikleri bir olay. Ve bir anlamda o gittiği şehre 20 bin kişi, 30 bin kişi sivil toplum üyesi, entelektüeller, government şeylerin hükümet temsilcileri orada bir fenomen ortaya çıkıyor. O iki soru yerleşme problemi ve şey sorusu e, konut sorusu o zamana kadar tartışılmadık şekilde o ülkenin içinde tartışılıyor. Gündemi belirliyor ve bu bütün ilgilerin yoğunlaştığı bir Olay ve bunun paralelinde bir festival havası var. Ve bu, bu, bu, bunları bence küçümsememek gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Ama bu, bu şey, metinleri okursanız ortaya çıkan metinleri, tabii Vancouver 
birin metni Habitat 2'nin metninden çok farklı. Neden? Çünkü tamamen ekonomik politikalar, politikalar değişmiş. Keynes ekonomisinin hakim olduğu, refah devleti kavramının hakim olduğu bir noktadan Washington mutabakatının hakim olduğu bir noktaya gelinmiş. Tabi bütün o kurgu değişiyor ama her kurguya baktığınız zaman o zamanki entelektüel dünyanın ulaştığı olgunluk düzeyini temsil eden önerilerden oluşuyor. Ama bu önerilere baktığımız zaman habitat toplantılarının ve metinlerin müzakere biçimleri dolayısıyla kaçınılmaz olarak bir iç tutarsızlık taşıyor. Birleşmiş Milletler artı ulus devletlerden oluşan bu yönetişim sistemi, dünyanın yönetişim sistemi içinde sorun ortaya konulduğu zaman bütün devletlerden katılımcılar o sorunun hedefler alanını olabildiğince geniş olarak tanımlıyorlar. Her devletin temsilcisi bu sorumluluk alanını genişletmek için yüksek katkı yapıyor. Ama buna mukabil bu sorunların çözülmesi için yapılması gerekenler konuşulmaya başladığı zaman ki o büyük platformda her cümlenin geçebilmesi için bütün ulus devletlerin evet demesi lazım. Herkes hayır diyor. Sonunda hedefleri amaçları büyük, araçları olmayan, araçları çok zayıf metinler ortaya çıkıyor. Ve uygulanmama meselesinin altında bu metinlerin müzakere edilme biçimi var. Şimdi birinci tartışma biçimini bitirdim. Habitat zirvesi ne demektir? Şimdi ikinci soruya geçiyorum. Üçüncü Habitat Zirvesi'nde işte o zaman onun yöneticisi olan Kulo'nun bir metnini okudum bu toplantı dolayısıyla. Diyor ki herkes serbesttir. İsteyen uygular, isteme, istemeyen uygulamaz. O zaman hiç kimse uygulamıyor zaten. İklimle ilgili metinlerde komitmentlar var. Bu metinlerde komitmentlar yok. Uygula uygulama. Bu bir çeşit ders kitabına indirgeniyor. Tabii bu neden böyle meselesi gelince bu soruyu ciddi olarak sormamız gereken bir şey. Biz bunu her yerde sormamız gerekiyor. Ama hiçbir yerde konuşmuyoruz. Çünkü Bugün dünyanın yaşadığı bütün krizlerin arkasında bu soru var. Dünya bugün yönetilemiyor. Ulus devletler ve Birleşmiş Milletler'den oluşan sistem ve bunların arasındaki ilişki biçimleri dünyayı yönetemiyor. İspat mı istiyorsunuz? Bir... Uluslar bu sistem Birleşmiş Milletler Sistemi İkinci Dünya Savaşı sonrasında niçin kuruldu? Dünyaya barış getirmek için kuruldu. Dünyaya barış getirebildi mi? Getiremiyor. Çünkü ulus devletler lokal savaşlarını sürdürüyorlar. Dışarıda fotoğraf sergisi var. Mülteciler, sığınmacılar. Bu neyi gösteriyor? Birleşmiş Milletler ve Ulus Devletler Sistemi'nin dünyayı yönetemediğini gösteriyor. Dünyanın ekonomisi büyüyor. Ama eşitsizlik de büyüyor. Niye? Çünkü çok uluslu şirketler regülasyon altına alınamıyor. Regülasyon altına alınmayınca da 
büyüyor ve eşitsizliği arttırıyor. Niye? Çünkü dünya yönetilemiyor. İklim meselesi bu, bu toplantıda da tartıştık. Kaç yıldır biliyoruz. Her gün kötüye gidiyoruz. Ka- karar alabiliyor muyuz? Evet, Birleşmiş Milletler metinler ya diyor. Metinler yanlış mı? Doğru. Ama yaptırımı yok. Demek ki dünya yönetilemiyor. Ben bunları çok arttırırım sayısını. Ve hiçbir platformda dünyanın yönetilmediği tartışılmıyor. Bu yasak. Yeni yönetim biçiminin ne olacağı da biliniyor. Kozmopoliten demokrasi. Ve multi-level governance onun altında. Çok kademeli yönetişim sistemi. Eğer böyle bir sistem kurulabilirse bakın neler olacak. Artık ulus devletler vekalet savaşlarıyla dünyada savaşmayı sürdüremeyecekler. Çok uluslu şirketler regülasyon altına girdiği için dünyanın büyümesi eşitsizlik yaratmayacak beraberinde. İklim meselesinde işte gönlünüz razı olursa yaparsınız meselesinin ötesinde etkin kararlar alınacak. Ve mal bunu uygulamak için kurulan çok kademeli yönetişim sistemi içinde de ne gelecek? Bütün yerel demokrasi açıkları, merkezin bastırdığı demo, e, demokrasi açıkları yok olacak. İkinci grubu da bitirdim. Ke, keseyim mi? Ha? İki dakika mı var? Tamam, peki. Şimdi üçüncü noktaya geliyorum. Habitat meselesi. İstanbul'un habitat yapması bence İstanbul'un ilk önemli mega eventiydi. Ve biliyorsunuz bu olay e, Rio 92 konferansıyla ortaya çıktı. O konferansa rahmetli Süleyman Demirel Cumhurbaşkanı olarak katılmıştı ve bir anlamda Rio'nun o mega eventin cazibesinin altında bu faaliyeti Habitat 2 zirvesini Türkiye'ye çağırdı. Ve Türkiye böyle bir şeye soyundu. Bu Türkiye'nin yapabileceği çok sınırlı bir şeydi. Çok zor bir şeydi. Bugün gördüğümüz sayıda hiçbir toplantı salonu yoktu. Büyük toplantıyı yapacak salonumuz yoktu. Biz bunu aldık bu faaliyeti ve ilk defa Türkiye'de bir devletin komitmanı, devletin raporları hükümet tarafından değil, Sadun'un söylediği gibi 250'nin üstündeki sivil toplum kurumunun katılımıyla sivil olarak hazırlandı. Ve benim bakımından da ben de bunun danışma kurulu başkanı olarak beni bu işe soktular. Ben de işte Habitat Zirvesi nedir? O Birleşmiş Milletler'de nasıl işler müzakere edilir? Onları öğrendim. Ve şunu gördük. Çünkü zirve hazırlanırken bunun mutfağında nihai olarak ortaya çıkacak doküman müzakere ediliyor. New York'ta, Cenevre'de vesaire. Biz de oradan oraya gidiyoruz. Ben o sırada bir yazı yazdım. Birli- öğrenmeye çalışıyorum Birleşmiş Milletler zirveleri nelerdir. Değişik zirveleri mukayese eden bir yazı yazdım. Şunu gördüm. Ee, Birleşmiş Milletler bir zirve yaptığı zaman o problemi doğrudan çözmeye çalışmıyor. Daha önceki zirvelerde sağlanan mutabakatları 
bu zirvenin hedeflerini transfer ediyor. Mesela sürdürülebilirlik sustainability Rio'da çıkıp buraya da transfer edilen bir şey. Biz müzakere ediyoruz, ediyoruz. Bizim toplantının adı şehir zirvesi. Şehirle ilgili hiçbir ilke yok. Ve ben dedim ki ya bu şehir zirvesi için bunların anlamlı olabilmesi için bir ilke lazım. Onun için e dediler ki söyle o zaman öner, öner. Ben de yaşanabilirlik ilkesini önerdim. Livability. Ve tabi Birleşmiş Milletler metinlerinde şöyle bir problem var. Bir şeyi önerirsiniz tanımlayacaksınız. Tanımlarsınız teorik olarak. Ama bütün katılanların üstünde hemfikir olmaları gerekiyor. Bu nasıl sağlanacak? Bir düşündük taşındık dedik ki bir yol bulabiliriz bunu. Birleşmiş Milletler'in tartışamayacağı şey nedir? İnsan hakları problemidir ve belirlidir. O zaman dedik ki yaşanabilirlik insan haklarının şehir mekanındaki tercümesidir. Bu, bu, bu on, o metin ona göre yazıldı vesaire. Şimdi ee, bu ilginç benim bakımdan da ilginç bir deney oldu. Türkiye bakımından da ve düşünün salon yok. Bütün o her tarafı ayaklandırmışsınız. Bir hafta önce salon bitti. Provaları falan yapması mümkün değil ve ve bunun arkasında bir büyük başarı var. O Yiğit Gülöksüz arkadaşımızın başarısı. Bu bütün yükü sırtlandı ve götürdü. Kendisini saygıyla anıyorum. Efendim, İran hocamıza da çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ee, tabii her zaman olduğu gibi soru cevap kısmına zamanımız kalmadı. Çünkü bu dakikalarda salonu bırakmak zorundayız. Söylememe gerek yok. Bunun bütün sorumluluğu bende. Çünkü bu değerli konuşmacıların herhangi birinin konuşmasını balla da olsa kesmek benim haddime düşmez. Onun için affınıza sığınarak. Fakat şunu söylemem lazım. Konuşmacılarımızın tamamı forum süresince e, sizlerin soru ve e, cevaplarına ya da katkılarına açık olacaklarını ve ellerinden geleni yapacaklarını söylediler. Dolayısıyla birkaç küçük notla isterseniz teşekkürle bitirelim çalışmalarımızı. Öncelikle işte Marmara Belediyeler Birliğimizin bu güzel organizasyondan dolayı hakikaten kendilerine ve bu organizasyonda emeğe geçen herkese teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Böyle bir e, katılımcı grubunu, konuşmacı grubunda e, bir araya getirmek hiç gerçekten kolay değil. Tek bir dilde konuşuyormuşçasına bize baştan beri destek olan değerli çevirmenlerimize de buradan teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Ee, siz değerli e, katılımcılara kuşkusuz izninizle e, panel olarak diğer arkadaşlarımızın da adına konuşarak hepinize katılımınız ve kat, katıl, e, bizi bu ilgiyle dinlediğiniz için teşekkürlerimizi iletmek istiyorum. Ve e, sizlerin adına da konuşmak cesaretini bularak kendimde. Bu değerli konuşmacılarımıza sıcacık bir alkışla bir teşekkürle bu paneli bitirelim izninizle.